Hello, and welcome to ILTV's Insider. I'm your host, ILTV Editor-in-Chief Mayan Hoffman. Protesters broke through a security fence near the site of the Democratic National Convention on its opening day Monday as thousands took to the streets to voice their opposition to the war in Gaza. The Democratic Party is riven by the same issue that has occupied Israeli and American Jews for 10 months, Israel's war in Gaza. However, the pro-Palestinian protests we are seeing in Chicago are a sharp contrast to those that took place during the Republican National Convention, which drew only hundreds and lasted a few short hours. Has Israel become a partisan issue? U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in the region to push for a ceasefire for hostage deal, telling parties it is now or never. There are less than three months until the American election, and the handling of the war on terror is still taking center stage. To discuss these intense challenges, I have with me four expert panelists. Dr. Eric Mandel, director of the Middle East Political and Information Network, the senior security editor for the Jerusalem Report, and a regular contributor to The Hill in Washington. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Next, we have Dan Perry, former chief editor for the Associated Press in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. He is also the former chairman of the Foreign Press Association in Europe. And also in the room is Abraham Katzman, a political commentator in the U.S. and Israeli media, who also serves as counsel to the Republicans overseas Israel. Finally, joining us on Zoom from Washington, David Wormser, an American foreign policy specialist. He served as Middle East advisor to former U.S. President Dick Cheney and a special assistant to John R. Bolton at the State Department. Today, he is a fellow at the Mizgov Institute for National Security and Zionist Strategy. Welcome, David. So we open today with some striking scenes from the Democratic National Convention where pro-Palestinian protesters were praising Hamas and themselves acting rather violent against police and counter-protesters. Some of these protesters are saying they themselves feel betrayed by the Democratic administration for its support of Israel during the war. Dan, who are these thousands of people in the streets? Are they dangerous? And will they ultimately influence Democratic policy on Israel? Look, I wouldn't discount the danger that comes from woke narratives and uh, some sort of odd nouveau anti-Semitism in the U.S. But let's face it, the, the events in Chicago so far are nothing of the scale that we saw in 1968. I mean, that was an earthquake in U.S. politics. With all due respect to the uh, campus agitations currently, we're talking here about thousands, not tens of thousands, only a few uh, dozen seem to try to breach the police barricades, and it seemed to be pretty much the usual suspects of Arab Americans who are understandably up in arms about what's going on uh, and, you know, some youthful progressives and therein lies a long-term danger to be sure. I mean, who are they? Are they dangerous? The danger is that Israel loses the next generation of American liberals. Israel probably um, cannot maintain its special alliance with the U.S. based purely on evangelicals and conservatives. Uh, it used to have the liberals and as the progressives get more and more powerful on the left, if Israel becomes an enemy of, of that branch of American politics, it's not, it's not a good thing for Israel. Well, you know, Abe, would you agree with that sentiment? We looked at the um, Republican convention. Of course, we saw something very different, where hostages received a standing ovation, where um, there were very few protesters that went outside. And, of course, they left very quickly because they weren't given much attention. So tell me a little bit about the contrast between those two. And do you believe that it's the Republicans that truly support Israel today? And as Dan said, we've lost the liberal lefts. The progressive left. The progressive, progressive left. Well, I don't know that, we, that we've had the progressive left, at least not in some time. <clears throat> the, excuse me, the, um, look, the protests that are going on outside say a lot because they really are a reflection of how they feel, how persuadable they feel the people inside might be. And that's one of the reasons there's virtually no protest outside the Republican convention, because there's, there's really, uh, who are they going to persuade to... Uh, you know, to, to go against Israel. But on the inside, it's a different story. And this is actually not a new story. In both 2012 and in 2016, there were floor fights over language that would go into the platform, language very critical of Israel. In 2016, it was voted down 55 to 45 percent but the 45% the left singing from the river to the sea. And we're talking about the Democratic National The Democratic Convention. Convention. Yes. And, uh, I mean, I can tell you from my own personal experience that 
I've never gotten a warmer reception than being at a Republican convention and saying, hi, I'm Abe from Israel. Amazing. Best opening line ever. Well, you know, but it's and it's interesting because Kamala Harris had a choice who she was going to choose for her vice presidential candidate, and as we know, she chose Walz. Um, she had a choice again about a Jewish governor, Governor Josh Shapiro, in his stead. Um, there was a smear campaign that took place against uh, represent, uh, Governor Shapiro, genocide Josh, connecting him to his Zionist ideals, and Harris, we understand, was very hesitant, partially because of. Josh's religion. So, David, I wanted to address this question to you. With anti-Semitism rising so sharply in the U.S. over the past decade, particularly in the last year, I think we can say, with the war, could this turn into some kind of rift between America and Israel if anti-Israel sentiment is really anti-Semitism? Might Israel find itself losing American support? Well, actually, I don't believe so, because I think the anti-Zionism, anti which is anti-Semitism, is actually still a marginal phenomenon in American life. Uh, every poll shows vast American support for Israel continuing. And even among the Democrats, it's now uh, more divided. But it, it, when you look at the actual electoral results, candidates that were pro-Israeli really tended to be also more pro-centrist, more from the liberal wing. Uh, APAC claims to have won all these uh, primary elections, but the truth was they, they supported pro-Israeli candidates who also tended to be more pro-center. And I think that's the real battle in the Democratic Party is you win national elections by going to the center. And I think the electoral strategy of trying to appease the far left will not work very well over the next five, ten years. So I, I actually think we're seeing the high water mark on some level of, of the uh, appeal to anti-Semitism or tolerance of anti-Semitism by leadership on the left. I, I, think, uh, I think most Americans are just not there. They, they still are fairly Judeophilic, and they, are, they see also the deep anti-Americanism that is accompanying this anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Sure. So I think it's a losing political cause in the long run. So, Dan, it, do you agree with that well, sentiment? It, I mean, it tends to be true that you win elections by attacking to the center, and we've seen that since Clinton, um, obviously. But on the other hand, you're looking at a potentially major generational shift. Right now, it's true that most Americans still are Judeophilic, as you say, and support Israel. But when you see polls suggesting that half the youth in America don't, uh, I don't think it's a profitable uh, strategy to label them all anti-Semitic. There is a major problem uh, that Israel actually is contributing to by the nature of the, the changes in Israel that are partly demographic but partly political. Uh, I, I don't anticipate a major uh, a, a meeting of the minds and hearts between a future America where these people are in charge and an Israel that continues to go down the path Israel is going, which is in a direction of autocracy, theocracy, and a binational state. So these, are, these are reality. It's interesting what you're talking about. I mean, we have an election, though, happening in three months. And, it, and Kamala Harris, it looks like, you know, in the next couple of days, by Thursday, will be given that ticket. I'm wondering, Eric, from your perspective, and hearing what Dan said and hearing what David said, will Harris's stance on Israel impact her ability to bring this election home? Will she be able to go to the White House or not make it because of how she relates to the state of Israel? Well, I, what's happening right now is I think the progressive anti Israel wing, the tail, is waving uh, the liberal wing, uh, the liberal dog. And this is a real problem. I think it's a political problem, not, it, because they are not targeting. They've made a decision not to target the independents, the Democrats, the blue dog Democrats, the never Trumpers, people who can go either way. And in states, because this election is going to be decided by maybe 100,000 people in six or seven states, yeah. that not targeting those moderates. Um, I think is a major problem here. Um, they do not want to, um, uh, you know, to, to do that. They've chosen to be progressive. You know, one, one thing that has to be added is the U.S. has, or historically has had, relatively low participation. And that uh, militates against the uh, going to the center argument because you also have to fire up your base to get them to vote. When only 60 percent vote, there is a real chance that the youth won't. And that can swing elections, as it did, for example, with Brexit in the U.K. The youth almost didn't vote at all, which is why Brexit won. 
It's actually fascinating when you think about voter turnout and how that can either impact the Trump win, even by default is what you're saying, because people just don't turn out and go to the polls, so they don't vote for Trump, but he wins because not enough people Th vote That's for more Kamala true Harris. when participation is low. I think, uh, look, the, the effect is real, but I think you're talking about really three main factors here. One is, uh, is campus activity. And, you know, we've seen that the campuses have really been taken over by uh, anti-Western, pro-Palestinian, maybe even pro-Islamic attitude, anti-colonialist, whatever you want to call it. But these universities uh, are churning out three million uh, newly indoctrinated uh, students per year, and that makes a big difference. Then at the same time, you've got a media, which I think at least uh, most people would probably consider uh, to, to have been for a long time somewhat subversive when it came to its reporting about Israel, but that has probably gotten even more so as it has moved from uh, more less journalism and more advocacy. And when you combine those with an administration that is largely made up of these of a, a more progressive than representative wing, all of these things make uh, there. There's a lot of noise made. There at least is a perception that this is very much the trend. That said, I think it's actually impressive how still pro-Israel the American population is. I think most people are not buying what the progressive wing of the Democratic Party is selling. Right, I think the last poll showed that about 80% of the American population continue to be pro-Israel, despite some of the noise that we hear in the background. I just wanted to, I, yeah. I, so I've been speaking on college campuses for the last 20 plus years, 12 since um, October 7th. Um, people think that the anti-Semitism just started on um, October 7th. This has been going on for many, many years. We're into our third generation, and Israel being, is in the colonialist, apartheid, victimizer, all based upon intersectionality, which is what's playing out in one way or another, which basically means people who are aggrieved, victims must stand together. Black Lives Matter, Palestinian Lives Matter. And so I was actually in the State Department three weeks ago talking about the reasons why you need to codify what anti-Semitism is, or else you cannot have consequences of what's there. And it gets down to is saying Israel does not have a right to exist as a state, a Jewish state, is that anti-Semitism. And to my mind, the IHRA definition, which says that, I think is incredibly uh, true, and it should be, because it's very hard to find somebody who's an anti-Zionist um, who is not having a checklist of many other things uh, in the anti-Semitic sphere, and double standards are a big part of it. So why are these protesters not um, out there screaming about what goes on in Iran and the misogyny and um, uh, the gay bashing and things like that. For sure. Or, or why don't they notice that uh, they themselves as Americans and American white people are uh, classic colonizers, if there can be such a thing as a colonizer and an indigenous person? Well, you know, you know a people coming back to their homeland should be something a progressive liberal embraces, but uh, Americans and, and, and indigenous peoples our history is is complicated too for sure you know and, and in the last few, uh, day and we've had here secretary of saint blinken who has been really pushing for us to sign the ceasefire deal and in fact uh, the news last night was that netanyahu has gotten on board and our next challenge is to get hamas to sign um but with that you know he has really stressed this idea that we need to end the war and the re realization was that when netanyahu went to the states supposedly we weren't there but he trump said the same thing get the war over with. So I'm wondering, David, if we can turn to you for just a minute to ask the question about whether or not that is actually a good thing. Do you think that we should be signing the ceasefire deal and ending the war early? Should we follow the lead of the United States, which clearly wants to move forward with this deal, if we have not completed the work that we need to do in Gaza? Well, I, I think the ceasefire deal has to be re-examined. It's based on a lot of assumptions from three, four months ago. Uh, including how to free most of the hostages and what's the best way to do so. Uh, I think uh, the, the, these, exa these assumptions have to be re-examined. There's also strategic issues Israel has to think about very seriously. The Philadelphia Corridor is a guarantee, uh, ultimately, that, that Gaza will not become another uh, uh, entity the way it was on October 6th. 
So I, I think there's great issues here that really raise the question of the validity anymore of some of the assumptions of the, the ceasefire. As far as getting the war over, I, I just want to make clear that what Trump was basically saying is that Israel is taking this too slowly and that it needs to win, but it needs to win quickly. He doesn't believe this should drag on another half year uh, in a low level. Uh, with targeted killings and so on and so forth. He believes in decisive warfare. So I, I would put his statement in that context. Uh, by the way, just to add to the last part of the uh, discussion, uh, United States, the, the youth in America also are turning against white America, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, also polling very much to the left on issues like communism. So it's a broader phenomenon. And I think that really raises the issue of anti-Semitism being driven by elites rather than a ground up phenomenon. It's our universities. It's our elites who are pushing forward on these anti-colonial intersectional theories and so forth that lead to anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Well, and I wouldn't want to take us back, you know, to the era of the Holocaust and, God forbid, compare what's going on in the United States to what happened in Nazi Germany. But if you remember, it was also the elites. In those times, there was a big buildup until we came to where we came, you know, in the 1940s. Um, I want to just quickly um, move this over also to ask um, you know, some questions about Netanyahu jumping on board. Now, Dan, you're a reporter for a number of years. And it was reported last night that out of the meeting, you know, Netanyahu was on board. He gave a speech. After a three-hour meeting with Blinken, somehow he was magically convinced to support the ceasefire. I don't know. From my perspective, I'm trying to understand, was Netanyahu already on board and just needed that extra push? Or is he on board but not really on board and the ceasefire is not really going through? I know you're not a prophet, but what's your take on what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, you mentioned my years as a journalist. If they taught me anything, it's not to uh, put much stock in what politicians say in public. And that goes double during wartime. And that goes triple during negotiations. So I don't believe Blinken any more than I believe Netanyahu, which is very, very little. Uh, I don't think we have time here to go into the details of the essentialness of the Philadelphia corridor, whether Israel really needs it or not, and ha whether Israel truly just woke up to that uh, after agreeing on May 31st to forego the Philadelphia corridor. Yeah. Uh, I think the reality is that um, Netanyahu is under tremendous pressure, not only from the Americans, without which he cannot conduct the war, mm -hmm. uh, but also from the Israeli people, three quarters of whom want him to prioritize the hostages and understand that he can live to fight another day under better circumstances without one hand tied because of the hostages, uh, should that leave Hamas somehow in power in Gaza. Uh, and, and, and he's reacting, I think, mainly to that. But in, in reality, uh, I'm not just not a prophet. I don't have powers of telepathy. And I think we're dealing here with a situation that, 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 that is basically a function of the decisions of two individuals, tragically, two, two individuals who tragically are sinoir, an arch terrorist clearly prepared to sacrifice half of his people to achieve amorphous ends. And Netanyahu, a cynical dissembler who will, I think, in my assessment, I've known him since 1988, do anything to cling to power. And Eric, I want you to react to that and also to talk a little bit about the influence that you believe that the American uh, administration has had on Il Israel's military endeavors thus far over the last almost 11 months. Um, it basically, um, my country, and I think this was a wrong, uh, wrong approach, had slowed supply lines. Um, I've been embedded with many uh, battalions over time. Supplies decreased starting um, in late 2023, right through May. Um, Israel should have gone and finished as much as it could, and I think that went against American national security interests. Um, you know, I, I know we don't want to go in the weeds, but I have to tell you, um, I have not found a soldier in the field or an officer um, who, whether they're right or left, secular or religious, who felt that you could give up what they knew on the field of the, of the Nitzarim crossing, um, allowing the terrorists to come back up north, or the Philadelphia Corps, the oxygen supply lines uh, for Hamas. And the idea, I think, is really is a wrong, that they think that after six weeks that they're going to be able to just go back um, with a part. I think that is the pressure from the United States is going to be huge. And when Americans hear the ceasefire bring home the hostages, they think that they're going to bring home all of the hostages. They don't realize this is a partial thing. To address those issues, Israel would have to control Gaza with two and a half million Palestinians. There's no good options here. There's only a, a question of choosing the less bad option. I can tell you in Israeli public opinion, 
I think we all know, about three quarters want the hostages' lives to be prioritized right now. Right, even and though the we don't know how many of eradicating of Hamas, if it were even possible, because the price is controlling Gaza forever, be left for a future time. But you right. Have, no, I'm going to yeah. interrupt okay, you because sure. we do only have another minute left, and I want to give also Abe and David a chance just to kind of close things up. David, with you for 30 seconds and really no more, if possible, if you can just speak about some of these mistakes. You know, we're talking about um, some of the issues that the U.S. has had in its influence in our military strategy, and certainly that pertains also to Iran. Can you, in 30 seconds, talk about whether or not you feel that the Iran discussion is not prominent enough here and what um, the America should be doing in order to help remove that forward even before Hamas and Hezbollah, if you so think so. Yeah, I think that the Iran issue is not prominent enough. And moreover, I think there's a larger strategic question that's not prominent enough, which is that Israel will not be able to depend on America that much. If you look on both left and right, we talked about the left trends. The right trends also, they want a strong Israel simply because they want to disengage from the region. So Israel will be more on its own, and America wants an ally that carries its own water and does more for itself. So Israel has to think how it wins this war in a way that allows it to be leveraged as a strong horse in the region that America can anchor a regional alliance to. That is the conservative point of view right now. And the Gaza war has to end in that context. It can't just fizzle out in Israel remains wounded and thinks, oh, the Americans will support us in half a year if we decide to, to restart it. This will affect the way the right in America views Israel. Is it a strong country that stands on its own and wins? That's an incredible, important branding that Israel needs to have going forward. Thank you. And last question, even though we are actually over time, so we really have to answer in just about 10 seconds. And I, this question is for Dan and for Abe, but really 10 seconds. The one question is, Given everything that we discussed today, who should the American Jewish community be voting for? Is it Donald Trump, or is it, if she does become the candidate this week, which it seems like she will, Kamala Harris? Abe, you start. Dan, you finish, but 10 seconds each. I think there is a fear that the this administration and the Harris administration will continue to play with the lives of 10 million Israelis and 6 million American Jews. And I think a lot of them will look at that and say, not this year, not these Democrats. You know, a lot of anti-Semitism is driven by the notion of, uh, of dual loyalties. I think American Jews should vote for what they think is good for America. But that said, what's good for Israel is not necessarily automatic support for Israel's right-wing government. Okay, well, that's all the time we have this evening. Thank you to our guests. For more of the latest updates from Israel, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at ILTV.TV. You can also purchase and download our app to receive alerts directly to your phone. Thanks for watching, Insider. Stay safe and have a pleasant evening.